By what name are you known? There are some who call me... Tim? Welcome to another episode of Timmy Talks, the channel where we talk old school magic. And today we are going to look at a finals played in the X Points. This is finals number nine of their monthly event. And in this finals, we're going to see a white and a blue deck full of creatures. So not control. No, this one is full of creatures. It's piloted by Joe, a.k.a. the Crouton Man. And he's playing against Rob Hackney. And Rob Hackney is also playing with white, but he's combined white with red. And his deck is also full of creatures, but also has a lot of control elements in it. So two different decks, two different strategies. Both players playing with white. And before I go to the deck deck section, I would just like to show you this. This is the points system of the X points old school. The X stands for 10. So each player can spend 10 points on cards in their decks. And when you see a deck photos, you can also see how the players have spent their points. And the reason that they do this is to kind of create more diversity in the decks and to make sure that, um, you know, the power cards are not as dominant I guess, as they are in regular other old school formats. So, you know, if you think this is this is something interesting for you, check out their Facebook page. Uh, you're free to join every month and the information, the link to their Facebook page and other information about this format can be found in the description below. Something else that you can find in the description below is timestamps. So for example, if you wanna skip this introduction or skip the deck tech sections, you simply click on the timestamp that reads MTG Games that will take you straight to the action. And here we are going to uh, continue with the deck decks. I'm gonna uh, start with the deck of Joe, his white and blue creature build. Let's have a look. And here we see the deck of Joe. So I've called it like blue and white aggro and you can probably see why. He's playing with four Savannah Lines, um, four Flying Man, and then he's added the Surrender Perfreed. So it's kind of, I guess like the line dip you could say, but he's also playing He's playing with a lot more creatures. He's playing it way more aggro than than control. He's playing four Juggernauts. That's something you don't see often in that combination. So Juggernaut, of course, four to cast a 5-3 that cannot be blocked by walls, which is not really relevant in most games, but still, I want to note that. And um, it has to attack every turn. Of course, the problem with the Juggernaut is that it's got that three toughness, right? And he's going to play against... Uh, Rob, who's playing a lightning bolt. So that could be difficult for him. But hey, still, if you don't have an answer to Juggernaut, I mean, it is five power coming at you every single turn. And then we also see two Triskelions. And you may think, isn't Trike a little bit too slow for this deck? Well, I actually don't think so. I kind of like the buildup of his deck. So it's aggro, but it's not all weenie, right? He's doing more than just dumping and dumping smaller creatures. Of course, he's got, you know, Flying Man with Unstable Mutation. He's got that going. He's got Savannah Lines going. It's super fast. Surrender Perfreed is super fast. Um, but then he's also got more of a, of a mid-range mix, right? With the Juggernauts, with into Sarah Angel, into Triskelion. Um, he's also playing two uh, books, Jam Day Tomes, uh, for some card draw. So also, if the game tends to take a little bit longer, he can still win it. It's not like he has to win it in the first five turns. He can win it later in the game. He's got weapons in his deck to do that. Also in the sideboard, he can go a little bit more to that longer strategy, you know, boarding in, for example, a control magic. Um, if he wants to go faster, he could board in some AO piles. Obviously, that also depends on the, the type of creatures that, that his opponent has. Uh, interestingly, here is, I think his opponent is playing with Preachers, so maybe those AO piles could be interesting against those Preachers coming in. And of course, the blue Elemental Blast is going to be um, going to be interesting here because uh, his opponent, Rob, is also playing with red. And then, of course, Rob is probably going to bring in the red Elemental Blast. So we're going to see some red, blue Elemental Blast fighting going on, even, although I think the key in these decks is really that white control package that both players are playing with, right? We've got the swords, we've got the disenchant, we've got the balance, it's kind of your usual stuff. Um, and they can have a huge impact on the match, right? Because when you, if you can find an answer to a threat at the right moment, so find a disenchant or, or, or swords, you can get ahead again. But it also goes the other way around. If you cannot find that crucial swords, for example, to take care of that flying man with an unstable mutation that's that's dealing damage in turn two, you know, that can have a deadly effect. If, um, you know, Joe cannot find that Swords to Plows here is to answer uh, that Preacher that, that that's on the side of Rob together with the Diamond Valley, then, you know, that's going to be crucial for him. So I think that Swords to Plowshares and Disenchants are going to have a big impact 
on this match. Okay, this is the deck of Joe. Now let's take a look at the deck of his opponent, Rob. And here we see the deck of Rob and Rob is playing white and red and his deck is more control. You know, when you, when you see this, there are a few things that I notice. First off, I notice four Rook Eggs. Now Rook Egg, really good card and I think really good in this matchup because Rook Egg is one red and three Arabian Nights. Uh, it's an 0-3 creature, so nothing special there, but when it dies in your end step, you get a 4-4 bird, flying bird token, right? So when it goes to your graveyard. So basically what Rob wants to do is he wants to wait for Joe to play out, you know, his Juggernaut. He plays his Rook Egg. The Juggernaut has to attack. It's going to attack right into the Rook Egg. That's exactly what Rob wants to happen. So he's gonna block and he gets a 4-4 flyer in return. Like that is ideal. Another thing that's ideal in this matchup for Rob is the fact that Joe is playing with tons of creatures. So he's probably gonna overcommit to the board. And why is that so great? Well, remember I was talking a lot about having answers and how sorts of plowshares would be important in this matchup. I actually think looking at the deck now of Rob, I think Wrath of God is going to be key here. He's playing two Wrath of God's main. So Wrath of God, two white and two for a sorcery that says destroy all creatures. They cannot be regenerated. So as soon as, um, you know, Joe is going to overcommit to the board with a lot of creatures, which is his main strategy, basically, um, you know, Rob can play out a Wrath of God and can have like a two for one or a three for one or a four for one. It's just going to be a picnic for him. And when we look at the sideboard, we see another Wrath of God in the sideboard of Rob here. I'm pretty sure he's going to board that in. By the way, is that a summer edition Quinton Hoover signed Wrath of God? Man, I'm jealous. Anyway, uh, so he's probably going to board that in as well. And there's just something that I'd like to note here. I think that um, the Diamond Valley is going to be great in this matchup as well. Diamond Valley card from Arabian Nights, a land. You can tap and sack a creature and then you gain life equal to the toughness of that creature. And this card works really well with Rook Egg, but also works really well with Preacher. So Preacher, a card from the dark, uh, it's just a 1-1, one, one, but you can tap it and then your opponent has to give one of his creatures to you. So your opponent can choose. But when you've got a Diamond Valley on board, it doesn't matter. You take one of his creatures, he's going to give you a creature. Then you're going to tap your Diamond Valley get life for his creature and next turn you're going to untap your creature again and you're just going to steal another creature from your opponent until you've eaten up all of his creatures with your diamond valley. So that means you're destroying his creatures and you're gaining life. That's just sick. And I just think, seriously, Rob, for you, this is a perfect final because your deck is so good against creatures. I think your deck struggles more against, uh, you know, strategies that don't rely heavily on creatures. You know, uh, maybe like like a, a land tax, land edge um, kind of deck, for example, or maybe a really, really quick aggro deck. And I think that is the way that Joe can win this. I mean, I'm not saying Joe has no chance at all, but I think if Joe wants to win this, he has to go really, really, really quick. He has to have all the right answers at the right time. Obviously, for example, a Swords to Plow series, here's that card again, works great against Rook Egg. Also, he can get those AO piles in from the sideboard to possibly kill the Preacher if he wants to, although it only works against the Preacher. Anyway, my point is Joe does have a lot of answers. So if he can have a combination of having all his early threats on the table, maybe a 4-4 Flying Man turn two, and having the right um, you know, answers to kind of mow down the Rook Act and the Preacher plants of, um, uh, of Rob, and then of course hope that Rob isn't gonna find like Wrath of God, um, then he, he can definitely win. It's not that he doesn't have a chance, but when I'm looking at this deck of Rob, what I think about is, okay, Rob has built this deck because he knows that X points is usually a field with a lot of creatures. So he's he's thought, okay, how can I just have a lot of answers to these uh, creature threats in my deck? And apparently it has worked, Rob, because you've reached the final, and now you're against a deck that has tons of creatures. So I think my humble opinion that Rob is really the favorite here in this matchup. Let me know in the comments below what you think. And now I guess we're ready to go to the actual match. We're going to start with the finals, number nine of X points. Here we go. Game number one, here we go. I believe it's Joe on the right side here on the play, starting with the Flying Man. So that's a good start for him. And then we have uh, Rob sitting on the left there, starting with the Mox Pearl and the Desert. And that's actually relevant, that Desert. Oh, it's so sweet to see a Desert being relevant because now what happens if Joe would decide to attack, then after damage is dealt, 
Uh, Rob could have used his desert and killed the flying man. Things are getting worse here for Joe, by the way, with that preacher. Okay, there is a Surrender Pafrit. He can attack right now, at least deal one damage. So he's gonna do that. I think it's a good decision, at least dealing one damage. And uh, next turn, he can, he can ask, yeah, because Rob's kind of tapping the preacher right now. Cannot do that yet because the preacher has summoning sickness. So now it doesn't have summoning sickness anymore. So remember, if you tap the preacher, your opponent has to give one of his creatures. Oh, fireball on the flying man. And this is really important because it means exactly now he can take over the Surrender Perfect because it's the only creature that Joe has. Oh, that is, that is really annoying here for Joe. And I guess Joe really needs to get rid of that preacher, needs a swords to plowshares. There is another flying man. Okay, that's something at least. So um, he's gonna just put the three, four there in his sleeve, I guess, or not. He's doing something. And uh, I mean, th things are just looking great right now for, for Rob. I mean, of course, the preacher's gonna stay tapped, gonna take a damage from that borrowed Surrender Befreet. I'm expecting him to attack right now. Oh, now he's got the combo. Now he's got the combo. Diamond Valley and Preacher. I talked about it in the deck tech. This is exactly what Rob wants to do. He can start eating away the creatures of Joe and then stealing them again with the Preacher. Now we see an attack here with two... Oh, I wonder what he's going to do with two Mishra's Factories. So two four fours. Looks like he's gonna cast a Disenchant here. Disenchant on one of them, so he's gonna take two damage, gonna drop to 16. I think this is a good strategy from Joe. All he can really do is be as aggressive as possible. Here we see an end step, Diamond Valley activation, eating that Surrendip. So now he gets to untap his Preacher again, and he can steal the Flying Man. There's a Plateau, I'm expecting him to steal. Ooh, there is a Sarah Angel. Wow. What can Joe really do? There's, okay, at least he can strip the Diamond Valley. So he's gonna do that. And then in response, he's gonna use the Preacher, eat it with the Diamond Valley. Exactly, he's gonna go to 21. One of the things that Joe could have done was wait for, uh, for Rob to kind of steal the Flying Man and activate the Diamond Valley. Then again, it, it would have been on the stack still, so that wouldn't really have, hap uh, have helped. There's an attack for four, five here, interesting. And then he's gonna untap the Preacher. I kind of expected Joe here to maybe um, use his factory. On the other hand, maybe that's exactly what Rob wanted because he had a uh, disenchant in hand. That could have been the case as well. There we see a Jam Day Tome. And I mean, it just looks like Rob's got full control here so far. He can now swing in for four again. He has five, why not? He can always use that mace to get his preacher back. So more damage for Joe here. He's gonna drop to seven. I think what Joe needs in this point is, um, okay, there's a disenchant, at least that's something. What he needs here is a balance. Balance kind of get him back into this. That would destroy the preacher and the Sarah Angel. Looks like he doesn't have it, just has to pass turn here. And there is a Rook Egg. I mean, things are only getting worse there. Joe at two. This could be a really quick game. Yeah, that's it. Wow, this is a really, 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 really quick game. Uh, Rob winning this quite easily. Now both players are gonna sideboard and shuffle up. So hopefully game number two is gonna give us some more tension. I kind of I kind of feel for you, Joe, because there wasn't much you could do here. It seemed that, um, that your opponent, uh, Rob here had all the answers at the right time. Anyway, both players are gonna shuffle up, sideboard, do all their shenanigans, and we'll catch back up with them in game number two. Game number two about to begin here. So Rob is one game up here in the finals, best of three. So Joe needs a result here, shuffling up his cards. Both players did some sideboarding. I wonder if we're gonna see some blue blasts and red blasts, and if we're gonna see that beautiful Wrath of God signed by Quentin Hoover. I'm so hoping to see that, Rob. You don't see beautiful cards like that every single day. Joe's still shuffling up. 
And if you'd like to see more uh, X-Points magic, by the way, um, the X-Points guys, uh, Louis, who's the organizer, also has his own YouTube channel. I'll put a link uh, to that in the description below. And also we have a really nice uh, X-Points playlist here on Timmy Talks. And I'll put a link to that in the description below as well. And you can see um, some other finals, just some other matches. It's quite nice. Here we see a plateau by Rob, by the way, and a Mishra's Factory by Joe, who's now playing a strip mine. And he's gonna strip that plateau. Gonna try to slow Rob down a little bit and a pass turn here. Let's see what else Rob's gonna do. There's a mountain and there's a Savannah Lions. Pretty nice, he can put some pressure on. Oh, again, the desert. <laughs> Oh, I just, I love how relevant desert is. Rob, you're the king of the desert, man. I appreciate it. There is a lightning bolt on the factory. This is something you don't want to see when you're Joe. You just want to deal the two points of damage. And I mean, because now he's a land drop down as well. So he's a creature down, he's a land drop down, and things are looking bad already for Joe here. Ooh, he misses his land drop, making matters worse. There is a Rook Egg. Okay, and there is a Quick Swords to Plowshares. I have to be honest. I think I wouldn't have done that, to be honest, because the Egg itself is not a threat at the moment. And now next turn, Rob can possibly play out a Sarah. Okay, there's a Hammerheim. There is another Rook Egg. I always kind of like to wait until the, you really have to take action. You know what I mean? Anyway, there's a uh, Surrender Befreet here by Joe. So 3-4 Flyer from Arabian Nights. This is the re revised version. That of course had the has the art of the if biff Ifrit on it. There is no not an attack with the rook egg. Just a pass turn here. Okay, so that's ooh, unfortunately, there's the swords. I just wanted to say, okay, that's good news, but there's the swords after Joe's taken a point of damage. Doesn't mean he gains three lives. Gonna go up to 22. There we see a flying man, but that desert is really doing a lot of work. I'm kind of impressed with that desert. There is a pass turn again. There is a maze of if to make matters worse. Yeah, Rob's deck is so good at not taking any damage. And the reason why it's so important, of course, for Rob is then when, when he's not taking any damage, he can work on his big plan, which is basically sack his rook eggs and create flyers or have that preacher trick again with Diamond Valley, what we saw in game number one. So again, we see a very controlling and dominant Rob in this game here. There we see a preacher so now he can start taking off one of the creatures. At least there's an answer from uh, from Joe. So that's very important. Just get rid of those creatures as soon as you see them. There is a City of Brass by Joe. Tapping the city, tapping some more. There is a Juggernaut. Again, Juggernaut's not ideal. Because what Rob can do now is just block the Juggernaut on the Rook Egg. There's another Rook Egg. And basically, Juggernaut works in the favor of Rob here. He can just block with his eggs all day long, gaining 4-4 flyers in return. And then when he doesn't have any eggs anymore to throw in front of the bus, he can just use his Maze of If. So there is an unstable mutation. Okay, I think, oh, putting it on the lion. He's going to attack with both then, I assume. But that means that Rob can block on both of his eggs. He'll get two 4-4 flyers. I wonder... If Joe's got any more removal, would have been cool if he would have played with Unsummon. That works great against tokens, but he's not playing with uh, with Unsummon. Attacking here with a 5-4 and a 5-3. I'm kind of expecting him to block on both of the eggs. So that means at the end step, he's going to get, get two 4-4 four, four flying tokens. And uh, that's exactly what's happening. And there is at least a blue Elemental Blast. Of course, they are red still, so that does work. That is kind of nice. There is a Disenchant on the Juggernaut. A little bit surprised with that. He could have waited. Then again, no harm, I guess, in, in, in taking care of it. Okay, there's a Preacher. Attack with the Rook Egg, by the way. So four damage for Joe. Joe dropping to 17. And there is, of course, a counter from the Unstable Mutation. And I guess if you're Joe, the first point of business is, I guess, to get rid of the Preacher. Although, of course, that 4-4 four, four Flyer is not ideal as well. And this is just a pass turn. This is really bad for Joe and really good news for Rob. Is Rob going to win? The finals here, it's already one game up. It's looking really good for him. It's gonna bring Joe back to 13. Remember, Rob can start using 
His preacher now as well, probably gonna do that in end, in end step. There we see another flying man pass turn. Then we see that preacher activation. He's gonna, he's gonna ask Joe to give him one of his creatures. So Joe has, has to make a decision here. What creature is he gonna give? Is he gonna give his lion that's gonna die anyway or is he gonna give his flying man? And it looks like they're looking something up perhaps. What is he going to do here? The line used to be a 5-4, but it's now a 3-2, uh, a so he's going to give the lion. And then he's going to take his turn here. So things, again, are looking really, really good. And I think that lion is going to take an extra counter, so it's going to be a 2-1, exactly. It's going to be a 2-1. It's going to attack. Looks like he's gonna block it on, okay, he's gonna block the 4-4 on the Flying Man and he's gonna take the damage from the Lion. There is a Disenchant. Yeah, okay, so it seems there's a Disenchant by Joe on, okay, on the Mox Pro. For a moment there, I thought maybe it's gonna be on the Unstable and the Lion would have died, but he already took the damage, so that wouldn't have been a very logical play. We do see another Flying Man here by Joe. But, you know, if you're Joe, it's going to be tough. He's going to give back the lion knowing that the lion is going to die anyway. Right? So, okay. I guess the lion, the lion's already dead. I think, I think the way it works is he untaps the preacher before upkeep. So then the lion goes to Joe. Doesn't really matter as much, but I think the line should die now in Joe's turn. Anyway, what has happened in between is an attack with the 4-4 bird, a trump block by the flying man. The other flying man's being taken by the preacher again. Things are looking really bad for Joe, and I think we can already start congratulating uh, Rob here on the victory. Because we see Joe dropping to three again. I mean, I think it's only out here... Ooh, he's actually going to kill his flying man. Interesting. I think his only out here is uh, a balance. Doesn't have it play soaring. That's it. Oh, man. You know, I mean, Rob, great man. Great success. But um, this was just really a bad matchup for, um, for Joe, you know, and a really good matchup for you, Rob. So congratulations. I'm feeling kind of bummed that I haven't seen that uh, summer wrap of God in action. Maybe you didn't board it in. Let me know in the comments below. Anyway, thank you both for sharing another finals here from the X Points. Also, thank you, Luki, aka Louis, for sending me these. He's the organizer of X Points. If you enjoy X Points, if you think, hey, I want to join this, you can join for free. You can find them on Facebook. The link is in the description below. And if you want to see more X Points, there's a link popping up right now to the playlist where I have all the X-Points matches that I have here on Timmy Talk. So if you want to see more matches, check them out. There's some really, really close finals in there as well. And for now, I would just like to say thank you very much for watching another episode right here on Timmy Talks, the channel where we talk old school magic. And if you want to support the channel and you're new here, welcome. Please subscribe and ring that bell. Thank you very much. And while you're at it, also leave a like, leave a comment, all that helps the channel grow. And then there's one other thing that you can do. If you enjoy the content that I make right here on Timmy Talks, you can support the channel and you can do that by becoming a patron on Patreon. How does that work? Very simple. There's another link. There's so many cards popping up right now, but there's another info card popping up right now. And if you click on that info card, that will take you directly to the Timmy Talks Patreon page. And there you can find out how you can support Timmy Talks, the YouTube channel. It already starts with $1 a month. And the cool thing is you get access to the Timmy Talks Discord. You get access to the Timmy Talks tournaments that I organize to thank my channel members and patrons of the channel. So, for example, we've got a uh, Ice Age tournament um, on schedule right now. So if you enjoy Ice Age, it might be worth checking out the Timmy Talks Patreon page because then you can support the channel, the channel that you like, and you can join a cool tournament. So it's like a win-win situation. So it might be something for you. And last but not least, your name will be mentioned in the end scroll at the end of every episode. How cool is that? Talking about that, let's go to the end scroll and let's take a look at the fantastic, amazing, wunderbar channel members and patrons of Timmy Talks.
Ik het was fikker te somber gezien.